So we're going to talk about animal structure and function today. Shifts on seen from the videos yesterday how um, something like size changes so much about the organism. From the way it's affected by gravity to how fast its cells have to work, how much energy it needs, lots and lots of things. From the shrew that needed to eat many times its own body weight a day to the elephant that only needed to eat like 10% of its body weight. Things of the size, shape, all of these things about an animal change lots of things. You may have seen these around. This is a sphinx moth, also called a hummingbird moth. Okay, so body plans and the external environment. The body plan or design of an animal results from a pattern of development programmed by the genome, the genes, the product of millions of years of evolution due to natural selection. Now we get some very strange looking creatures like the leafy sea dragon. So physical laws in the environment constrain animal size and shape. An animal like a winged dragon can't exist. Something like that would not work on this planet. In our atmosphere, no animal that large could generate enough lift to take off and fly. So they're good in fantasy, but there has to be some magic involved because the physics just doesn't work. Here's another example. Tunas, sharks, penguins, dolphins, seals, and whales are all fast swimmers, and they all have the same basic shape. It's called fusiform, tapered at both ends. So dolphins and sharks, you've got a fish and a mammal, very, very far away from each other evolutionarily, and yet they have very similar shapes. There's an ichthyosaur, a prehistoric reptile that looked almost exactly like a dolphin. It's not because they're related, one's a mammal, one's a reptile. It's because that shape works really well in the water. So the physical laws in the environment constrain the animal size and shape. The fusiform shape minimizes drag in the water, which is about a thousand times more dense than air. If you've ever tried to run when you're in a swimming pool or something, it's just not the same. The similar form of speedy fishes, birds, and marine mammals are a consequence of convergent evolution in the face of the universal laws of hydrodynamics. So the way water works means this shape works well. And so lots of animals, it's called convergent evolution, we'll talk about that more later. They become more similar looking even though they're not related. Lots of examples of that. So you can see all of these animals, you can tell them apart, but they look very similar. Even though you've got two fish, a bird, and two mammals. None, not very closely related at all. So take a look at this video. Maybe. Cassie, I'm coming! Anybody remember that from Ant-Man? So, an animal's size and shape have a direct effect on how the animals exchange energy and materials with its surroundings. The respiratory system of an insect would not work on a large animal. So, so much for Mothra and Ant-Man. You can't get insects that large. The way they breathe doesn't work. Their respiratory system is very different from ours. So if you took an ant and made it that size, it would die very quickly. And that's not even talking about the metabolic rates and things like that that would have to change. So taking an ant and just making it the size of a dog, the ant would not survive. In the past, we've had dragonflies with like a six foot wingspan, but that's because there was actually more oxygen in the air at the time. I've heard, and I don't, haven't done the research to see if this is true, but if you did bring back a Brontosaurus or a T-Rex, there was more oxygen around then, so those animals would not be able to survive in our atmosphere. Okay, so in most animals, you have a combination of various tissues that make up functional units called organs, 
and groups of organs work together as organ systems. So you start with cells, cells come together to make tissues, tissues come together to make organs, and organs work together as systems. Tissues are groups of cells with a common structure and function, and there's four main categories, epithelial, connective, nervous, and muscle tissue. Epithelial tissues cover the outside of the body and line organs and cavities within the body. It's kind of a protective layer, like your skin. Connective tissues stick the tissues together. Muscles are long cells called muscle fibers that are capable of contracting when stimulated by nervous impulses. So allow for movement. And nervous tissue transmit the signals from one part of the animal to another. In us, it's from the brain. But in a lot of organisms, they don't have brains, and we'll talk about that. In all but the simplest animals, you have organs, but um, the most simplest, what we have, we'll talk about first, are the sponges and the cnidarians. They do not have tissues, they just have organs. I'm sorry, they don't have tissues organized into organs. They, a sponge is just many cells put together, but they're not, you don't have the similar kinds forming tissues. The cnidarians or the jellyfish, some of them do have tissues and organs, but some of them do not. Organ systems carry out the major body functions of most animals. So you have your digestive system, which is made up of several different organs, or your respiratory system, the circulatory system. Okay. So bioenergetics. Animals use the chemical energy in food to sustain their form and function. All organisms require chemical energy for growth, maintenance, and repair, regulation, and reproduction. That all takes energy. Just sitting at your desk, you're using energy. We talk about that as burning calories. Um, your heart's beating, your breathing, all of those things require energy. You're keeping your body temperature up at the right temperature. Animals are heterotrophs. You should have learned this last year. Heterotrophs means they must eat. They get their chemical energy in food, which contains organic molecules synthesized by other organisms. So where a plant can make its own food just from the oxygen, and the carbon dioxide in the air and water, um, animals have to eat something else that was once alive, whether it's a plant or an animal, um, something. We have to, we, we can't just sit out in the sun and make our food. The amount of energy an animal uses per unit of time is called its metabolic rate. The sum of all the energy requiring biochemical reactions occurring over a given time interval. And that's very different for different animals. Say going from an elephant to a hummingbird, the metabolic rate is hugely different. The two basic bioenergetic strategies used by animals are ectothermy, which means cold-blooded, and endothermy, which means warm-blooded. You've probably heard these terms before. And here's examples of the difference. The, in these pictures, these are thermal pictures, the brighter the color, the hotter the temperature is. The bluer the color, the colder. And so you can see here's a cold-blooded lizard sitting in the hand of a warm-blooded person. You see how much warmer the person is than the lizard? And with the scorpion, it's even more impressive. The scorpion's body temperature is way lower than the body temperature of the person. So here's an example of how this works. By collecting solar power so efficiently, reptiles need to use very little of the energy they generate themselves to warm their bodies. In fact, they use around a tenth compared with a mammal of a similar size. That means they don't have to eat very often. A puff adder, like this one, can wait almost indefinitely for its next meal. Amongst predators, patience really is a virtue. Whilst waiting for a meal to wander within striking distance, a snake shuts down its body processes so that it uses the minimum amount of energy. Only the equivalent of a pilot light is left on. 
and it can remain like this for weeks. All around it, mammals are expending their energy in a way that, compared with the snake, seems extraordinarily extravagant. But when a snake needs to move fast, it can do so with lightning speed. Okay, so you see how the difference between the mammals and the reptile? The reptile could be going around hunting its food like that, but they don't, they're cold-blooded. They don't have as much energy. So that means two things. They don't need as much food, and they, um, they don't have as much energy to use. So a lot of reptiles spend lots and lots of time sitting there waiting for food to come to them. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So ectothermy, cold-blooded. It doesn't mean their blood is cold. It just means that their blood stays the same as the environment. They gain their heat mostly from the environment. Most fish, amphibians, reptiles, and invertebrates are ectothermic. You see turtles doing this a lot. Water is cold, and water is really good at taking, even if it's not cold, it's really good at pulling the heat from your body. So turtles bask in the sun to get their, to warm up above the water temperature. The ectothermic strategy requires much less energy and therefore less food than is needed by endotherms because of the energy cost of heating or cooling an endothermic body. We spend lots of energy changing our body temperature. They have lower metabolic rates than endotherms. Their heart rate is going to be slower, their breathing rate. Ectotherms are generally incapable of intense activity over long periods because they don't have that energy. And they're usually inactive when exposed to cold temperatures. All the lizards you see around outside, if it was 20 degrees outside, you wouldn't see any. They're going to be hiding somewhere because if they were out, they wouldn't be able to move. If they were to try to move, it would be almost in slow motion. And so this is why you can have things like a python or an anaconda. They can eat a really large meal and not eat again for a year. A mammal could not do that because even if we could eat something really large, our metabolic rate uses energy so quickly, we couldn't go, there's no way we, a mammal could go a year without eating. And yet reptiles are able to do that because they need much less energy because they're not spending all that energy warming their bodies. Think about it this way, if you want to turn the air conditioner on in your house or your heat on in your house, your electric bill is going to go up, right? It takes energy to heat the house and it takes energy to cool the house. But right now your body temperature is somewhere in the neighborhood of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. I doubt that you're sitting in a room where that is 98 degrees. Um, if you take room temperature around 75 degrees, your body is 30 degrees warmer or 30 the inside of your body is 30 degrees warmer than the surrounding areas. Endothermy, this is warm-blooded, means maintaining the body temperature within a narrow range by heat generated by metabolism. It's a high energy strategy that permits intense, long duration activity of a wide range of environmental temperatures. So you have polar bears. It may be 10 degrees there or even colder, maybe below zero where this polar bear is. They're active in that temperature. You're not going to see alligators with the polar bears. Alligators are cold-blooded and they cannot move and they cannot be active when it's that cold. And um, if you think about it, your body temperature stays the same, whether it's you're in the side and it's 70 degrees, whether you're outside and it's 100 degrees, the inside of your body temperature is going to be 98.6 degrees. In the winter time, it could be 10 degrees outside and you're snowboarding, your body temperature is still going to be 98 degrees. Birds and mammals are mainly endothermic, maintaining their body temperature within a narrow range by heat generated by metabolism. 
In general, endotherms have higher metabolic rates than ectotherms and need more food. So the birds and mammals eat way more than reptiles. Another thing, your body temperature stays in a very narrow range. If it's just more than a few degrees above or below 98.6 degrees, you're going to be very uncomfortable. Just think about how you feel when you have a fever. It's just, say you have a fever of 101, that's just maybe three degrees above normal. And if your body temperature drops, your core body temperature drops even three or four degrees, you're going to be shivering drastically. It'll be very uncomfortable. Um, Cold-blooded animals don't have that problem. They, their body temperature changes many degrees. So here, this shows the temperature of the environment and the body temperature of the organism. So here's a river otter. Its body temperature is going to be right around here, even as you change from almost zero degrees Celsius to 32 degrees Fahrenheit up to 30 degrees Celsius, which is around 70, 80 degrees, something like that. But anyway, the air temperature, the environmental temperature gets much warmer. The river otter's body temperature stays the same. For the bass, it changes with the water temperature. You can see it's at 30 degrees body temperature, it's 30 degrees out environmental temperature. 20 degrees, 20 degrees, very similar. So cold-blooded organisms get their heat from radiation from the sun, conduction by sitting on warm rocks. So see reptiles a lot, a lot of the lizards around here sitting on warm spaces when the air is a little bit cooler. Wind, on the other hand, it's going to cool them and they're going to lose heat from their body just from it radiating into the environment. So they manage their heat budgets very differently. Ectotherms, cold-blooded organisms, gain most of their heat from the environment. They have such a low metabolic rate that the amount of heat it generates is too small to have much effect on the body temperature. Endotherms, warm-blooded organisms, can use metabolic heat to regulate their body temperature. In a cold environment, an endotherm's high metabolic rate generates enough heat to keep its body substantially higher than its surroundings. So that polar bear's body temperature is going to be much, much higher than the water it's in. And it has other adaptations like a thick fat layer and the different adaptations about its fur to keep it from freezing when it's in the water like we would. Many ectotherms can thermoregulate by behavioral means, such as basking in the sun, seeking out shade. Another thing, you don't see a lot of reptiles in the hottest part of the day if out in the sun. They're going to be hiding in the shade somewhere. A common misconception is the idea that ectotherms are cold-blooded, endotherms are warm-blooded. We use these terms, but a cold-blooded animal's body temperature might be very warm if the outside air is very warm. And if, they could be much, if you have a lizard out in the desert, its body temperature is going to be much higher than ours sometimes. They don't necessarily have low body temperatures. So when sitting in the sun, many ectothermic lizards have higher body temperatures than mammals. But no ectotherm can be active in below freezing weather. But many endotherms function well in such condition, like penguins, um, like polar bears. You don't see lizards running around in Antarctica, but you will see mammals and birds. Endothermic vertebrates also have mechanisms for cooling their bodies in hot environments, allowing them to withstand heat loads that would be intolerable for most ectotherms. But ectotherms can tolerate larger fluctuations in their internal temperature. So like I said, an alligator's body temperature can change tens of degrees, where if your body temperature got 10 degrees above what you are right now, you'd probably be dead. Um, and we, the mechanisms we have for cooling our bodies, sweating, when we sweat, water evaporates from our skin and that takes heat away. Dogs pant. There's many different adaptations to keep the organism cool. Right, let's talk about body size influencing the metabolic rates. Metabolic rates of animals are affected by many factors besides whether it's endothermic or ectothermic. The amount of energy it takes to maintain each gram of body weight is inversely related to body size. 
So each gram of a mouse consumes about 20 times more calories than a gram of an elephant. This is what the two videos you watched yesterday were about. A smaller animal also has a higher breathing rate, blood volume relative to size, and heart rate, and must eat much more food per unit of body mass. It's like they were talking about in the video about the shrew that needed to eat many times its body weight and the elephant doesn't come close to that eating as much of its body weight. Okay, so um, hummingbirds, their body temperature is going to be much higher than ours. Their heart rate is going to be much, much higher, and they move a lot faster. Whales, elephants, they're going to move slower than us, and their heart rate is going to be much slower. We'll talk about that as we talk about some of those whales and elephants later on in the year. Okay, so that's all we're going to talk about today. Um, have a good day and stay safe.